Hi everyone, let's talk about Dawn of Peacemakers, which is kind of long overdue, isn't it? I've been over the video for it quite a while ago now, but here we are. And if you haven't seen the playthrough and you're wondering where the game is and what I'm talking about, it's in the description. Go and look at that if you want. So, we have played through six of the scenarios, halfway through the campaign. It's one of the games that you know, we were loving and got really into, but Essen happened and got in the way, and since then, other games happen. We don't really get to go back to that many games, but yeah, we have played quite a bit of it and unlocked a fair few nice surprises as well. As I mentioned at the end of the playthrough, this is a scenario-based game, but it's full of, you know, well, not full of, there are some sealed envelopes and sealed boxes and things that, yeah, provide a lot of nice surprises and, you know, unlocks of rules and things. The first scenario that I played through, if you're thinking, you know, it's kind of a bit basic and not much is going on, it's kind of an evolving game. It teaches you as you are going. The campaign book is the rules and there is a separate index for you to reference various things if you just need to look something up. But the, the campaign is set up not just to show you all of these nice shiny things and surprise you and stuff, but it's there to teach you the game as well. So more is added as the scenarios go on. So it's got some really, really nice surprises, better than uh, some, you know, proper legacy games that we've played. This is all completely resettable. It's nothing's torn up or written on. It's just things are unlocked and opened and information is provided so you can reset it all if you're worried about that kind of thing. But the, the game as a whole, so the the thing that kind of attracted me to it in the first place, you know, it's, it's from the designer and illustrator of um, Dale of Merchants, which is a really nice deck building game. Maybe we'll play through that one day. Uh, so it's the same kind of aesthetic, the same kind of uh, animal world that's really charming and endearing, and it really helps the story come across. But also, you know, cooperative games I'm up for anyway. But this kind of theme of this, this kind of AI war game that's going on in front of you, and you, your role is not in those units whatsoever. It's in these completely independent, completely separate adventurers that you know don't have really their own you know hidden agendas and things. Their only motive is that you know this shouldn't be happening, and we need to stop it from happening. We don't want anybody to be killed. We don't want a full blown war to break out. And so while you're Goals and while the, the things that are happening change and get more complex and uh, perhaps harder to deal with as the game goes on, that is ultimately what you are trying to do. And I really like the, you know, the, the resource cards all refer to these different things that we're doing. You know, we're whispering in their ears, we're poisoning their food, just, well, giving them food poisoning, not, you know, actually trying to get them killed. And, you know, the worst that happens to them is that they are defeated and, you know, carried off, and that demoralizes their army. It's all about keeping an eye on their, not their morale, their motivation, and trying to lower that. And it will inevitably happen as the battle goes on. So, Maybe you're just trying to fortify everything and keep everybody alive and wait for them to just get fed up once uh, once those cards keep coming out. And yeah, the, there is, you know, there's, there's randomness in how this comes out. And the first maybe half of the playthrough, they were kind of meandering and not really doing anything. Sometimes they do that and you kind of have to uh, nudge them along yourself. It's just kind of the nature of how these decks work. But when, you know, setting those rare occasions aside, Generally, it's a really nice, a really nice surprising way of these armies interacting with each other. And, you know, the, the, the decks are set up according to each scenario. So the number of move cards that each army has got, you know, the, the Ocelots hardly have any moves and the Macaws have more. And the, the Ocelots have more cover because, you know, they are the defenders. They're the ones that are being attacked and will need all of that cover and things. And you need to kind of anticipate that based on, you know, what you've built up and your influence actions to see what cards are coming out and try and make sure that, you know, at the start of this scenario, I remember when we played it, you know, our, our first thought is, you know, protect the Ocelot because, you know, they are going to be attacked. And they were, you know, the Macaws were just relentless in trying to kill the Ocelots. And so our defenses were really necessary. And so the Ocelots fight back a bit. And then you realize that, oh, no, now the Macaws need help because we don't want any side to surrender. And you can have it where both sides end up surrendering. And that's the 
ultimate worst outcome because you want uh, both sides to not get to the point of surrendering, but get just fed up enough, just uh, demoralized enough that they just want to call the whole thing off and come back another day. You know, it doesn't end the story. The story still continues. And if you lose and sides surrender, you still don't, uh, you don't stop. You don't replay that scenario. You carry on, but note down the outcome because it's going to influence the story as the scenarios progress, which is another great big plus. So yeah, it, it can be that sometimes they're just going around in circles doing nothing and you need to nudge them along but uh, often it's a really nice system especially with the speeds as well and the priority of the actions that say yeah, there's fast normal and slow and then move cover and strike it's a uh, it's a really nice interaction and the, the attack priority is nice as well you can you can predict what is going to happen to a certain extent but you've never got enough cards and actions and things to know a hundred percent what is going to happen all of the time and that's kind of the the point of it as well that you are you're doing everything you can you're doing all of these uh, sneaky means that uh, are at your disposal but you can never quite know what they're going to do turn to turn and it's full of uh, nice little touches like that like the directions that they're moving in that's going to influence their actions and their attack priorities one one little thing that i thought was and and this might change you know we're only you know I don't, I don't want to spoil things in the campaign. There, there's more things to come out, I'm sure, that, uh, that I can't speak for the final thing. But this deck is made up of all four of the characters, you know, have their artwork on these cards, and the actions themselves are kind of suited to those characters. So, you know, the, the one that is... Uh, the one that is you know giving false orders and things that's me that's the that's the fox the the liar the the cheeky chappy that is uh, just uh, just believable and overconfident that you know people just believe everything that she says and you know so she has those cards they are kind of themed to the kind of things that those characters would do but it's just one great big resource deck and the players end up just with cards from this deck the you know it's it's still something I've massively enjoyed, but one little thing that I thought was it it would have been nice if my if if I had a deck that was more customized to me doing all sorts of those things. But you know that's 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 a different game then, isn't it? That's just something that uh, that occurred to us while we were playing through it that we would maybe like a little bit considering that we we picked our characters based on their descriptions on the front of the campaign book, and that does come across a little bit in the resource deck. But yeah, we would have liked a little bit more than that. But as I said, we haven't finished the whole thing yet. So who knows what's going to happen in those few games. But yeah, overall, it's a it's a really charming, beautifully drawn, uh, really endearing little story of, you know, this, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's all animals. So it kind of that's probably kind of adds to the the Disney uh, endearing element of it. But, you know, aside from all of that, uh, you know, wanting to influence the story, want, really wanting to help out, really wanting to prevent all of these things from happening. It's a really fantastic cop where you do have to keep, uh, you constantly have to be interacting with each other because not, not just because you can share symbols and stuff, but you know you need to be looking at the motivation constantly and seeing where you need to be because you know if you want to influence the macaws, you need to be standing on their space. If you want to be uh, giving food poisoning to the ocelots, you need to be going and standing over there. So it's about it's all about your positioning and not just the cards you're using. What uh, which faction you're going to use your influence on to take a look at their decks which of their decks are you going to look at and then how are you going to order these things and you know if you spend all of your influence on the task and you're like oh we really really need the ocelots to cover this turn so we've we've spent loads of influence and put cover on top and then you didn't spend anything to look on the play deck and then it turns out oh it's the revoke action which means they're just getting demoralized and not doing their task this turn so yeah it's it's full of twists and turns and things and yeah it's it's not going to it, oh, the, I haven't even mentioned. I was just going to say it's not going to satisfy the people that just want to fight. There's a skirmish mode in it. I can't really speak much about that or at all about it because I haven't played it. And if you know me, then you know that we have zero interest in games where we are fighting each other. So this, that's, I think I mentioned that at the start. That's why this theme, this, uh, this way of doing things appeals to me so much that we are watching a war game happen by uh, unseen players and trying to influence it so that the war game is just called off. And I really, really like 
that uh, that aspect of it. But if you are after a bit of a skirmish and a bit of a fight between yourselves, there are rules and some extra cards and things that you can play the battles against each other instead of the co-op where you're trying to call them up instead. As I said, I haven't played that at all and I haven't got any interest in playing that side of it, but I do appreciate that it's there to appeal to more people and more situations. You know, you can play the co-op thing with one group and then maybe you've got a group that just loves fighting it and you can still play the same game with them with the extra modes. I think I've talked enough about this. Hopefully I've given you some <laughs> insight, maybe. Maybe I've piqued your interest into Dawn of Peacemakers. The playthrough is there though. I played through the whole of Scenario 1. Don't spoil anything if you haven't seen it, apart from the fact that there are slots and McCaws in it and stuff. Depends what you class as a spoiler really, doesn't it? I feel that the ending is going rambling and tailing off. So I'll sign off now. Thank you very much for watching this. And if you'd like to see more playthroughs, there's hundreds on this channel. Go and find one. They're great, probably. Thanks for watching, though, and I'll see you for the next game. Bye.